Uh, before we get started, just a couple more of those housekeeping bits. Uh, this ranch is a working cattle ranch. It doesn't have a learning center like Archbold does. So this is by appointment only. Uh, it's not open to the public. And right now we're not taking any tours at the moment. The other bit of housekeeping is that uh, it's the good and the bad. The good is that this place exists. It's kind of amazing when you think about it because there are 21 million people living in Florida and we normally have about 100 million tourists as well. So to have a beautiful site like this that's 10 and a half thousand acres where there's panthers, bears, alligators living wild and free out here uh, is just a wonderful thing. But it also means that it is pretty remote. So even though I've got my little signal here, my MiFi, we did some practices earlier and I just wasn't able to be able to keep a signal by walking around and looking at things like I normally do. So I'm gonna be here, I'm, I'm over next to the office building in our little hammock and I'll be kind of the MC today, putting on videos and then discussing what's going on in them. Uh, I don't know if anybody has noticed behind me, there's a doe and I think it's four of her little babies. And I've been, they've been out here for at least a half an hour when I got here. I'm gonna move backwards and see if I can get a little closer without, without spooking them. I'm gonna turn my camera around and hopefully you can see them and they, and they, and they don't run away because they've got a nice little shady spot here. So I'm gonna turn this around. Love to be able to see over in the chair. They're definitely watching me. I'm gonna zoom in. They're definitely watching me, thinking, uh oh, we're we gonna have to get up here. What is this guy doing? If you can see them, then write in the chat. I don't know how blurry it is. Oh, a couple of them just took off. There's one right in front of me standing up, uh, kind of in the shade though. Okay, I'm gonna turn this back around. I, I'm, I'm gonna move over here so I'm not disturbing them and they can lay back down in the shade. <laughs> well, my plan for today is to do an overview of what Buck Island Ranch is about. We're going to go over uh, the ranching, some of the cultural history, the land use history, some of the research and conservation projects here. After, uh, that'll be about a half an hour or so, and after that, we'll do a question and answer session. And we're very lucky because we have Dr. Betsy Bowton with us. She runs all of the research here. She'll be here for that Q&A. So that's when you can really ask some detailed questions about what's going on at the ranch. And our lead cowboy, the ranch manager, Gene Lawless, I just saw him, he's out working, but he's gonna to try to get back and on his computer by 10 o'clock so he can be here for the Q&A too. I've been coming out the last week and recording myself, kind of adventuring around here, looking at different things. Uh, but I'd like to start with the first four minutes of the video, Cowboys and Scientists. This is on Archbold's YouTube page. Recommend it and uh, we're just gonna do the first four minutes of the video it can do a better job of showing you what this place is than I can. We're gonna to try to drive them that way, then turn them and go up that way. All but one. There's always one, no matter what group it is, there's always one that gives you a little bit of a fit. <laughs> Twenty-four years ago when I first came here, I, I met a local man and, and he said, so you're the man here to destroy the cattle industry in the state of Florida. And I kind of knocked me back 
a little bit. And I said, well, sir, I'll be honest with you. If uh, we don't get the science behind and get the numbers to prove what we're doing's good, you're already dead and you don't know it. I believe the land is what draws us together, that it's the land that allows us to do operations, and it also allows us to do the science. And they're, they're all one and the same. It's all interconnected. You know, when you see the wood storks, the bear, the occasional panther, the otters, you name it, it's all here. Everything that thrives on this landscape, it makes you feel that you're doing not just your job, but you're serving a greater purpose. These are Crocker cattle, descendants of the first cattle that came to Florida in uh, Ponce de Leon. Ranching's been here, I guess we could say 500 years. We'd like to see, look forward and be 500 more years. I've always felt that being on this large scale, and it's not this little checkered laboratory, it's a real world laboratory. Gene's favorite thing to do is be out on his horse and managing the cows and making this operation successful. And that happens in the field. And I think that's the same for the scientists, is that for us, the understanding of the natural environment comes from being out in the field. And that's something we have in common, that we both love the land. I think the soil is, because people think of it as dirt, it's, they don't see the, the beauty in it, but there's like a whole universe of microorganisms that are living in the soil and doing things for the grasses and, and the plants that are growing here that support cattle and wildlife. The ranch is my lab, and we can do science in this natural setting in a place where agriculture is occurring. One of the misconceptions is that cattle are extremely damaging to the environment. If you manage them correctly, you can actually have positive effects on the environment. When cows graze plants, they're stimulated to invest more in their roots, and then that causes more carbon to go into the soil. And we're still learning about these things. There could be situations where the management that benefits nature also benefits the cattle operations. The potential for a win-win situation that's really the grand challenge that Archbold and Buck Island Ranch are working towards. I've seen Cowboys and Scientists, that video so many times, and yet every time I watch it, I, I love it. <laughs> I, could, I could keep watching it, I still love it. It does a really nice job of showing why this is a special place that we, we do have the agriculture, we have the cowboys, but then we also have the scientists and it all works together. I know we have a lot of Florida people um, that are watching right now, but we have, we have other viewers from other states and we might have some viewers from the UK too, we usually do. So your first thought when you saw that we were doing a, a tour here might've been, Wait, what? A cattle ranch in Florida? <laughs> I thought that was out west. And it's one of the, the best kept secrets of, of Florida is that we are a ranching state. In fact, Florida is the first state to have ranchers. So about 500 years ago, the Spanish brought over, they brought over cattle, horses, pigs, um, and they established that here before it got established out west. Some of the cows that are here now actually are descendants from those original cattle in the 1500s that were Andalusa stock, which is pretty cool. They're, they're a bit smaller and they have long horns. The males and the females both have long horns. 
And we do actually have some of those here at Archbold, uh, here at Buck Island Ranch, and some of the other ranchers in this region still have them too, as because of that cultural heritage, they want to keep them around. This is 10 and a half thousand acres right here, and we've got about 3,000 mama cows, and we sell around 2,000 or so calves. This is a, a cow calf operation. That's a lot. It puts us in the top. 20 ranches in the state of Florida, but the biggest ranch in all of the United States is in Florida. The Deseret Ranch, they sell about 35,000 calves each year, which is really pretty incredible when you think about it. Today, we're not making a living off of those cracker cattle because they're a lot smaller. We sell mixed breeds here. A lot of times what we have is called Brangus. So it's Brahma and Angus breeds, but we also ha have uh, Hereford and Charlet mixed in there too. Well, when, um, when you do come down here and you wanna get to this office, you've gotta take this long road. It's, it's like three or four miles long, beautiful dirt road. And I came out a couple of days ago and filmed going down this road because there are some cool research projects on, on just on the road coming down here. So we're gonna put up that video right now. This is, I think it's six minutes long. Here we I go. I am here at the entrance to Buck Island Ranch, Archbold's 10 and a half thousand acre working cattle ranch. It's a ranch, it's a nature preserve, and it's a biological field station. On the sign, you can see it says 2S. That's the Buck Island brand. It stands for Two Sons, the two brothers that started this ranch back in the 1940s. Buck Island is one of my favorite places anywhere, and I'm excited to show you around. Let's go. One of the first things you notice when you visit the ranch is the, is the landscape. It is very flat, it's open, there's not a lot of trees. You do see cabbage palms in the distance and some live oaks. You also notice that it's not filled with cows. We have, we have about 3,000 mama cows here and we have calves, we have bulls but there's a lot of space for them to move around in and we move them from pasture to pasture. It's not that this is an, an especially environmental ranch. It's just a typical ranch for this part of Florida and that's how they work. Lots of space. So they are uh, agricultural, but they are also wonderful natural areas for panthers, and bears and all kinds of other critters to move through. I want to get to our one of our Carbon Eddy flux towers, but it seems the only way I can figure out how to get there by walking is to go through this ditch right here. So I am uh, gonna gonna do it all for you. <laughs> I'm walking through the ditch. I'm walking through the ditch. I hope an alligator doesn't bite me as I walk through the ditch. I now realize there are more ditches on the way to the tower than I thought, but we are going to make it there. This is ditch number two behind me. We've made it to the tower. This is one of Buck Island's five carbon eddy flux towers. These are like super duper weather stations. You can see they look a little bit like something that you would put on Mars. They are taking regular weather data like the temperature and rainfall, but they're also measuring greenhouse gas emissions, specifically carbon dioxide. 
we put them in different parts of our property in order to see how our land management practices, like how many cows we put out there, will affect the greenhouse gases. They can measure whether the carbon dioxide is going up into the atmosphere and we're producing it, or whether it's being taken in by the plants and being sequestered in the ground. So they're measuring both of those things. Pretty cool, right? So glad I got to show you that. Now I'm gonna head back across the field through the five ditches to my vehicle and see what else we can find. At the end of our long driveway, we come to some offices and buildings. There's a pasture with horses and a beautiful lake right here. These buildings behind me are actually houses. We do have cowboys and researchers living here and raising their families here. It's a reminder that sustainability is not just about the environment, but it's also about the economy and culture and families. At Buck Island Ranch, we are trying to support all three. Now let's go take a look at those horses. I've got this beautiful horse right here. This is one of the horses that still get used to, to work cattle here at Buck Island. Of course, the cowboys and the cowgirls have trucks and other kinds of vehicles, but if you need to get in and out of a ditch to, <laughs> to get, your, get your cows, a horse is still the best way to do it. Behind me is Buck Island Billy, a three-month-old cracker horse full. Mary Margaret is our horse trainer. This is her horse and maybe she'll let us get a little closer. <laughs> hey everybody, my name is Mary Margaret Hardy. Um, I'm the ranch operations assistant out here at Buck Island Ranch. She is having a ball letting me love on her and scratch her. I fed her some sweet feet earlier so she's, see she's trying to lick it off my hand. <laughs> I, lo I loved getting to scratch Billy there and um, it's kind of fun when I put the music on because it was like he was kind of bobbing his head, <laughs> bobbing his head to the music. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, why Archbold even is running a ranch. Archbold has been around for a long time, since 1941. It's a, a research and conservation organization and we've been here running, running this ranch since the late 1980s. Archbold has three pillars, research, conservation, and education. I want to go through real quick uh, what that means for this ranch, because all three of those are fulfilled here. The research part might seem obvious because we've already been looking at it. It's the opportunity to study ecology on a real ranch, not just for us, but for students from different universities, for us to be able to collaborate with um, all kinds of other, other places, other organizations, universities, agencies, and ask questions about the soil, the water, the, the air, cattle stocking rates, biodiversity, endangered species, disease ecology. I mean, everything you can imagine, we can do it because we have a whole big old ranch here. It's not like a small hobby farm. It's the real deal. Two is conservation. Conservation is about location, location, location. The Northern Everglades, that's 2.6 million acres in Florida. That's the land that flow, where the water flows south to Lake Okeechobee, which is the mother of the Everglades. 2.6 million acres is a lot. One million acres of that is like this. Uh, it's a whole bunch of cattle ranches, private cattle ranches. So the conservation part is that we need to recognize that ranchers are stewarding a million acres in this region, stewarding the land, uh, and that is really important. 
because as more people move to Florida, these ranches are getting uh, bought out and then turned into developments, turned into new towns and things like that. Um, and yeah, you could make a beautiful town right here, but as these ranches disappear, this is gone. And this is the home for so many plants and animals. Okay, uh, we've got another video we're going to pop up and we're gonna bring it up right now. This one shows you what the landscape around here looks like. It doesn't have any sound. So I'm going to actually just talk over this one. And I showed part of this in the other video. Well, let's take a look here and see how beautiful that is. But when we see something like this, which is, you know, full of life um, and, you know, is doing all kinds of good stuff, we also need to not make the mistake of thinking this is untouched. Even though this is wild, doesn't mean it's untouched. You can't forget that the decisions people have made have influenced this. So when I'm looking out here, I'm seeing a few things. One is all that grass is not native to Florida. That is Argentina bahia grass. And it was put in because it's nutritious for the cows. I'm also noticing that, you know, there are tr some trees out there. And there's always been some trees, but today there's more trees because it's drier, because of all the ditches that we have here. And I also see there's that beautiful uh, pond or little lake right there that is artificially made. There probably there was a, a little pond there, but then it was dug out and made larger to help drain around here. So we cannot forget that when we're looking out at a site like this, it is um, it's not untouched. And Laura, you can stop you can stop sharing the video. So let me talk a little bit about the history of this region. How did it get to the way it is right now? I like to imagine going in a time machine. Whenever I'm visiting a natural area, I think, what would this have looked like 150 years ago or more, you know, 200 years ago? And this would have looked, in some ways, very similar to the way it looks right now, but also pretty different, too. So if you went back 150 years plus, you would have had Seminoles here. This is called Buck Island Ranch because the Seminoles named it, not ranch, but they named it Buck Island. The spot we're at is just a little higher and drier than the land around here. So in the wet season, they would take canoes across the prairie, the wet prairie, to right here where I, where I am right now, and could go hunting for the deer here. And we just saw the deer are still here. It used to be that if you went to the Brighton Reservation, they have a casino there. This is just a few miles down the road. Um, and you told them the story of Buck Island, they would give you like some credits uh, at the casino. I don't think they do that anymore. But the Seminoles have been, have, have been here and there have been Native American peoples in Florida for you know, over 10,000 years. But something big happens about 150 years ago. There's three Seminole Wars. And after the three Seminole Wars, the Seminoles have been pushed back further and further into the swampier parts of Florida and Everglades. And then you have drainage projects. This area was very swampy and uh, Florida wanted to be able to have agriculture and have people move here. So they started draining all of this wetlands, all these wetlands out here. And it worked, you know, it really worked very well. But it does cause some problems too, because that water is now flowing that would have sat here uh, from the rain and just moved real slowly south, Lake Okeechobee, now flows much faster to the lake. And there's a couple other problems too. So we're gonna put up another video that talks a little more about this and uh, a project we're doing to, uh, to help to help with some of these water projects. I'm at a special spot right here. You might be able to tell that behind me is a ditch, though it's kind of hard to tell because it's a bit overgrown. The reason I stopped here was because of this metal culvert. And you can see behind me here, there's a solar panel and a computer. This is part of a bigger project 
called the NEPES, Northern Everglades Payment for Ecosystem Services. And what we're doing here is trying to slow the flow. If you look behind me on this side, you can see this ditch that's stretching out behind me. And this culvert has just has some a riser in it that helps slow the flow of water. And that is so important because if we can slow the flow, then the water will start to naturally be cleaned by the plants growing here. Slowing the flow has another benefit. It helps control the water levels further down in the headwaters at Lake Okeechobee. The state controls how high or how low the water can get in that lake. And if it gets too high, they have to let it flow to the coast. They have an artificially designed system to do that. The problem is the water in the lake has too much phosphorus in it and it can grow harmful algae. So we don't want to be uh, flushing that water out to the coast where it can create harmful algal blooms and kill fish and other creatures. It'd even be bad for human health if we have, if we're breathing it in, it's not good for us either. But this is an amazing project. Not only is it cleaning the water, helping to control the lake levels further south of here, but it's a win-win because the ranchers who work on this and there's about 20 different ranches that participate they all get paid by the state of florida to do it it is a win-win helping ranchers to stay in business while helping with our water quality projects that affect not just the people right here but millions of other people in florida I should also say that that, that one uh, riser that we were looking at there it is just one of many. We have, I think it's 42, something like that, and Betsy will be able to tell us in a little bit when we get to the Q&A. Um, over 40 of these are just on our property alone, and we're slowing the flow, something like 20% um, coming off of our ranch, which is pretty cool. So far, all we've looked at has been in the high ground part of the ranch that has been the part that's uh, converted that we call improved pastures. And I was talking about that a little while ago. But let me show you one last clip that will not, don't put it on yet, Laura. <laughs> and I'm gonna be showing you one last clip that will take you down uh, on a buggy tour through the, the parts of the property that haven't been converted. They have ditches on them, but you'll see there's tall, tall grasses, there's a, a hammock forest down there as well. And about 40% of this property is actually uh, recognized conservation land. It's in federal conservation easements. So I wanna talk about that a little bit. Now I want you to imagine that you grew up here and maybe, you, maybe you're 80 years old, 90 years old, and your family has had this ranch for generations. Their blood, sweat, and tears are in the soil, and it is such a deep part of your identity. But you know that after you die, this ranch is going, is, isn't going to be a ranch anymore, that no one's going to keep it up much longer after you long for various reasons. Well, what can you do? Because the idea of it getting bulldozed down and, and turned into a parking lot uh, is, is pretty horrible, right? It's pretty, pretty terrible. There is a tool, and it's called a conservation easement. It's all different kinds. They can be at different levels. You know, it could be with the state or with a nonprofit. The ones that we have here are um, with the federal government, and they have to do with water because we're in the watershed for the Everglades. And basically what happens is, you sell the development rights to part of your property. That means that if, if Archbold, for whatever reason, we're not planning on this, ever sold Buck Island Ranch, this part where I am right now, that's not an easement, could turn into a little town. But like I said, about 40% of the property would remain wild. And nobody, but future owners can't build anything on it. 
ranchers get paid for this. It's not as much as if they would you know, just sell their land to a developer, but keep in mind, it's still their private property. So they're, they're able to keep it wild, and depending on the type of easement you have, like with ours, we can still ranch out there. We still have cattle in those areas too. I mean, that is what I call win-win, totally. An amazing win-win, wonderful project, conservation easements. So these lands can be protecting nature, but also still supporting those ranching families. So um, we're gonna do the Q&A in a couple of minutes. I have a short video here and after the time lapse part, it'll be me in the woods with a flute. The idea here is to recognize the inspiration that this place can have. It's not, it's not just about the, the environment being healthy or the economy or supporting jobs. It's also about the inspiration that we get from these places and uh, paying our respects to the people we, who come before. So we're gonna get that video up for you right now. And uh, just take it in and enjoy it. We live in some stressful times right now. Here's a little bit of uh, peace for you. Thank you all for joining us. That spot is my, uh, my special spot. I mean, when I think about all the places I've been to in the world, that one spot with that tree that's behind me is just one of those places that uh, I just love it so much. So it was really nice for me to be able to get to share that with you. Well, we're gonna move into the Q&A section here. You can use the Q&A, if you're on Zoom, you can use the Q&A box. If you're on Facebook, type it in in the chat and, and um, we'll have somebody copy it in so we see them. Uh, but we do have Dr. Betsy Bowen on. So let's get, uh, let's get her video up too. And Betsy, once we get your video on, maybe you could just, just introduce yourself a little bit um, and then we'll take the questions. Oh, we've got, we have Jean here too. Awesome. So those, these are the two people that were in the video we played at the beginning. And these are the ones that run the, the whole ranch out here. And they're going to be able to answer all your questions. <laughs> so let's get your videos up. And um, Betsy, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Betsy Boughton. And I've been the program director of agroecology at Archbold since 2010. And I'm by training a plant ecologist, but working at the ranch, I have worked on lots of different things, water, soil, greenhouse gases, um, and learned a lot from working with the cattle operations. And it's just a great place to work because I'm always learning new things. Mr. G, you want to hop on there and just give us a real quick uh, intro? Uh, am I here? Yep, uh, I hear you uh, here. Okay. Uh, I'm Gene Lawless. I'm the ranch manager here at uh, Archibald's Buck Island Ranch. I've been here for 27 years. And um, 
again, like Betsy said, really enjoy working here because it's an opportunity uh, to work together with the scientists and uh, share our uh, what we do on a working cattle ranch. Laura, do we have some questions? We do have a few questions. Nathan and Riley would like to know, when was this place made? When did we start Buck Island Ranch? Gene, you wanna take that one? I'm gonna to try to stay out of these questions since we've got you two here. Okay, uh, well, well, Buck Island Ranch, actually, as Justin said earlier in the film, uh, in the uh, show there, uh, Buck Island received its name, uh, and we estimate back in the 1830s, uh, 1830 to 1840 in that range. Uh, Buck Island, so it re received its name from a, a Seminole Indian chief, uh, Billy Bowlegs II, I think it was, if I recall correctly. Uh, and then after time went by, uh, we tracked back to around 1840 where different people had cattle that ran through this area. Uh, and then I noticed Dustin mentioned the 2S brand, the two sons, uh, the Durrance uh, brothers, uh, started ranching here in 1940. Um, and then Archibald took over the ranch in 1988 uh, with a 30-year lease from the John D. MacArthur Foundation. Uh, and now Archibald has purchased the ranch in 2018. Great, thank you. Caroline asked, how are the research projects that are run at the ranch chosen? This sounds like a Betsy question. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so at the ranch, since this is a working cattle ranch, one of the things we like to think about with our research is what are the problems that are occurring? What are the issues that ranchers would like to learn about, especially in how ranching impacts the environment and how they can manage more sustainable? The ranchers are very interested in that question because they want to be good stewards of the land. And we work a lot with um, lots of different ranchers. So they're interested in questions of how to best restore wetlands, how to manage water on ranches, and how to manage fire, which is a, a tool that they, lots of ranchers use and they have been using for many years. And they also would like to know what um, type of grazing regimes would be optimal for both environmental values, like maintaining biodiversity, and also um, at the same time as maintaining production and, and um, for the cows. So that's one way that we decide, um, asking ranchers what they're concerned about and what they need information on. We also work a lot with different agencies, government agencies, both state and federal. And sometimes the state and federal agencies will have questions they're interested in too. Like they're interested in what is the value of ranches for biodiversity? What wildlife lives on the ranch? And before Archbold started working here, not many people knew that these were, um, valuable wildlife habitats, but they didn't have the data. And so Archbold was able to collect the data. We've made species lists over the years that we've worked here. And we've, we have 170 bird species recorded on our bird species list. We have over 480 plants on our plant list. And 85% of them are native. Um, so just collecting this data and providing it to state agencies and federal agencies so that they know the, the value of these ranches for wildlife is very important. They also might ask questions about greenhouse gases. That, that's a question that the general public has been interested in over time um, in recent years. So cattle are known to produce methane um, that's when they're digesting the grass in their four stomachs 
and they burp a lot of methane out. That's from the bacteria that are helping the cattle digest the grasses. And so a lot of people ask, what's the carbon footprint of the beef I'm eating? And so Archbold is here to try to figure out what those questions are that people are asking, whether they be ranchers, the general public, or state and federal agencies. And we collect data on those, those problems or those questions so that people are more informed. All right, thanks, Betsy. So I have a question from Bill that could be probably for all of you. Has any trace of the Calusa people ever been found on the property? Have you found any artifacts or anything? Don't everybody uh, jump in. <laughs> <laughs> I do know we have had several archeological surveys here, um, especially with one of our big wetland restoration projects that we're doing with the USDA wetland reserve program. We just had like a month long survey of archeologists that came out here and they were looking for artifacts. I haven't seen their reports yet, so I don't know. Um, I think the most recent tribe is the Seminole Native Americans, but I'm not sure. I don't know if Jean knows. I, yeah. Uh, uh, no, we have several. Uh, what I was told were uh, Gene, we're, we're not we're not getting your your audio very well and, uh, right now. Uh, out of the water to eat lunch is what I was told. A few artifacts, uh, uh, but nothing. Sorry, I'm on my phone. My computer's down, so I'm trying to do this off my cell phone. Can you can you hear me now? Yes, sir. That's better. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so they're 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 just higher raised area. The mounds down there. Uh, were for the for the Indians to get up out of the water, stop, have some lunch, and then move on. So I didn't know if you heard that they, they have found some pottery and a few things like that, uh, is all I've been told. Um, I can add this one, in the chat here. Okay. I, I can add one more thing. Um, not on this property specifically, but I had the, the fortune of getting to photograph on an archaeological um, I guess dig is what you would call it a years a year ago, I guess, which is in the same watershed uh, just a little ways from here where someone had been walking along a river and saw that there was an ancient dugout canoe in the water and uh, called the appropriate people and let them know a whole team of archaeologists from around the state came out and I got to be there as the photographer. And, oh, it was amazing. This, so dugout canoe is, you know, um, I forget what kind of wood it ended up being, but you know, you've got a tree and you, you dig it out and it's one piece and you can stand in it and use, a, use a, an oar. If you look up photos of the, or paintings and things of the Seminoles, you'll see what I'm talking about. After they looked up the age, once they got it out of the water, they found out it was 4,000 years old. So that predates anybody that was calling themselves Seminole, Seminole uh, or Calusa. That goes way, way back, which is like just super cool. And it might have been Hurricane Irma that had dislodged the boat because nobody had noticed it sitting there before. Um, and maybe it had dislodged it and had moved down the river a little ways. And then, and then somebody saw it. So, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, awesome. So I have a couple of scientific questions here. Andrea would like to know how the fancy climate station, we forgot the proper name, how is it able to measure carbon going into the soil versus the atmosphere? That's a good question and I will answer the best I can. Um, 
since I'm not the expert at eddy covariance, which is what that tower is called, and we work with collaborators at University of Illinois and Cornell, and they analyze all that data. Um, but the, the name is eddy flux, and eddy is spelled E-D-D-Y. And so if you think of the wind making an eddy um, and sort of floating over those sensors, the sensors use lasers that analyze those little wind eddies that are passing through the sensor and it's analyzing the amount of carbon in the air. And the interesting thing, they can tell if it's, um, if it's being taken up or released by looking at those concentrations of carbon dioxide in the air. And typically during the night, um, plants aren't photosynthesizing because there's no light for them to photosynthesize. So you're seeing positive and larger values of carbon dioxide in the air at night. And during the day when plants are, have their light shining on their leaves and they're photosynthesizing, they're taking up carbon and you see that the values of the carbon dioxide in the air are very small or even um, very, very low. So that's one way they tell. So if it's a large value of carbon dioxide in the air that the sensors are measuring, that's gonna be carbon dioxide releasing. And if it's very low or zero um, carbon dioxide in the air, that's when the plants are taking it up. So that's a very simplified explanation. Excellent. And I think you kind of went over the next question regarding that. Courtney had asked, do you find that the ranch is sequestering CO2? So I'll mark that off. All right, we have, yeah. you want to uh, go with that? I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, we, we do find that the ranch is a sink for carbon dioxide because we have these huge grasslands and wetlands that are taking up carbon dioxide. But the thing that you have to look at is all the greenhouse gases together. Um, so you have to look at how much is emitting um, through methane, which is another source of carbon in the air. Um, and in really wet years, um, when, we, when all of our wetlands are full, we actually become a source of carbon to the atmosphere because there's natural processes in wetlands um, where when soils are wet, bacteria that produce methane are very active. And our research has shown that cattle are only producing about 16 to 30% of the methane budget at Buck Island Ranch, and the rest of our methane is from wetlands and wet soils. All right, I have two questions about flowers. Are there any flowers? or trees around there? Obviously we see some trees, but Kylie asks, have we ever planted any trees or flowers? Um, we haven't because we have so many plant species on the ranch. Uh, I mentioned we have about 480 plants on the ranch and we have lots of native wildflowers in our wet prairies and our wetlands. And so we, and water helps disperse those seeds. So when we get a big flood event, when we get a hurricane, the whole ranch is flooded and water is dispersing wetland seeds naturally into our, uh, into our grasslands and our wetlands. So we haven't really had to plant them. Um, one thing we do do is we do control nat non-native species. So we do have some bad weeds on the ranch like kogan grass and ligodium and we do try to and smut grass and those are bad for biodiversity so the ranch tries to um, control those with herbicides okay so an anonymous attendee asked this is for both of you guys but we'll start with you betsy since you're unmuted. What does a typical day or week look like for the rancher and the research folks? Um, so a typical day for the research folks, 
uh, really depends on what project we're working on. So right now we're working on an exciting project to collect soil samples all across the ranch. So we're attempting to collect like 2000 soil samples in a gridded array across the ranch so we can look at our soil nutrients and phosphorus. And so right now, four of our research staff are going out from 8 a.m. to noon during the day and we have our GPS that tells us where to go and collect the soil samples. So they are driving out all across the ranch, collecting the soil and they do that for the morning and then in the afternoon we have to sieve all that soil. So a lot of people are in the, in the hottest part of the day, we're inside and we're just sieving soil and drying it and getting it ready for nutrient analyses. Another thing project that we're working on a lot right now is our water project. So Dustin mentioned NEPES and we monitor water levels, not just on Buck Island Ranch, but about um, 14 other ranches in the watershed. So we have a couple staff that drive out to those projects and make sure our equipment's working. They have to go to each monitoring site. Um, they make a manual measurement to the water to see if the equipment is measuring the correct depth of the water. And they do some maintenance like cleaning solar panels and changing desiccant in our data loggers. So the desiccant makes it so it doesn't get too moist inside. Um, and then we have to make reports. So we, all the data from those water sites are going through cell phone telemetry to our office and our staff check that data and make sure that it's good. And then we have to provide reports for ranchers and the state agency, the South Florida Water Management District. So that, that's just a couple different um, types of daily things that we do. Sometimes we have plant species composition where we go out to wetlands and we go to different points in the area and put our plot down and measure what plants are growing in that plot and how much of each plant. And um, that's another thing. And then an, uh, another, uh, project is the greenhouse gas project and we measure little points on the ground in addition to the eddy flux tower so we have these little chambers on the ground that we go and measure like these really small areas and see how much co2 or carbon dioxide is coming out of the soil so uh betsy i just saw a comment that said dustin can you give a, a simplified version of what, of what betsy just said <laughs> So um, I'll try. I'll try to do that. You know, I think that was a good answer because what it shows is there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot that they're doing. So the first thing is uh, taking soil samples. We we actually saw that in the first video. You saw Betsy with a big tube and a and a like a hammer smashing it into the ground. That's one way to do so, to do soil samples. We have a lot of land here, and we wanted to get an idea of how the soil was different in the different parts and what kinds of chemicals are in the soil, natural and unnatural. So they're taking 2000 samples all over the whole thing. That was the first project. And then uh, the other project that NEPES won is that we have lots of ditches here that have some of these little water control units that slow the flow but there's other ranches that are also doing the project and uh, our job is to go to those ranches and check and make sure it's working clean the solar panels off um, make sure that the data is good and, and what she means by that is that that something's not broken you know so you can go to the site and check and if your data says that you know some number that seems like totally wrong you can go, uh oh, we need to fix, you know, there's something wrong with our computer or something. Um, and I don't remember what else she said, but I think that was, I think that was about it. So, so Jean, what about on the ranching side, ranching operations? What is a typical day? And when does the typical day start? Oh, uh, well, we usually start at daylight and usually go to about dark. It just 
just all depend on the day and time of the year. Um, so say if we're what we call working cows, we will start before daylight, get everything, you know, bring the horses in, feed right at daylight, get them in. Because we're trying to do everything according to the time of year and the temperatures. Um, so we try to do everything as quickly as possible to make it uh, comfortable on the animals as well as uh, the uh, cowboys and cowgirls. Uh, we maintain all property, uh, do, all, do most all the burning on the property. I see there was a question on burning. Uh, we burn about every two to three years. It just depends on the growing season and the area of the ranch. Uh, we also do some mowing, some disking, you know, uh, chopping, aerating. So it's all the property maintenance that we take care of. There's never a dull day. We're always doing something. I hope you heard that. Yes, sir, we heard it. Thank you. Let's yeah. see. Uh, technology. <laughs> yes. Our technology today is tough. Oh boy, we're losing you again, Mr. Gene. I, we have a couple of more questions in the Q and A for you about whether we have pigs and goats. So if you wanted to type those answers, you could do that. Yeah. And uh, Sabine asked, "Do we do wildlife monitoring at the ranch?" Yes, we do. Um, we work with USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, and we have a grid of game cameras. We have 40 game cameras on the ranch and they're taking pictures of the wildlife um, using the ranch. And we've been doing that for five years. Okay, and how many cowboys and cowgirls work there? That's from Will. Um, can you hear me now? You're a little, you're a little slow, Mr. Gene. I, maybe if Betsy can answer that one. Yeah, um, Gene, correct me if I'm wrong, but I am thinking of four cowboys um, that manage our about 3,000 cows here. And sometimes when we have a lot of work to do, like when we're working cows, we hire temporary day workers. Um, and we do have cowgirls too, cowboys and cowgirls. Nice. And I think, I think Betsy, I think you touched on this, but someone asked how many invasive plant species there are. I know you talked a little bit about the grasses. Off the top of my head, um, we have three or four pretty bad invasives that we work hard to control. And we have more than that, but the four big ones are Kogan grass, Brazilian pepper, smut grass, and ligodium that are extremely noxious and we do use herbicides to control them. Betsy, can you talk about uh, the pigs too? Yes, um, so we do have feral pigs on the ranch and the feral pigs are an invasive species and they're just wild, so wild pigs on the ranch. So and we have about 400 to 500 wild pigs at any one time on the ranch and they create a lot of damage. They like to root up, so they're eating things in the soil and they basically till the soil, um, like they're plowing the soil so they can create large patches of bare ground and in wetlands and grasslands. All right, Mr. Jean's back. Yeah, we'll try it. I won't make no promises. <laughs> 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 All right, we only have a couple more questions. Kylie asked if we are organic. Uh, no, we are not organic. Uh, you know, we have tried some grass-fed cattle. Um, 
but it, the, one of the main reasons we don't do it like in an organic system is we want our our operation to be very similar to all of our neighbors. Uh, that way, the research that's conducted here, it's not outside of what's going on in the greater region, would be one of the main reasons for that. Okay. Okay. And the last question. Yeah, sure. Okay. Gene, could you say something about the Florida, uh, the Florida brand? Uh, yeah, you know, we, we do, we are involved in a local product and it's called Florida Cattle Ranchers, uh, where there's about 18 of us ranchers that have joined together uh, to try to bring a local, a fresh from Florida, uh, locally grown, regionally uh, harvested right here in the state of Florida. All right, and the last two questions I'm gonna combine. Do we have any goats or wild fruit trees? We do have a few goats, uh, predominantly just to eat a few weeds around the offices and things. Uh, we used to have quite a few wild fruit trees scattered out through the, through the woods, but most of them are, are pretty much all gone now after the different storms and things. All right, Dustin, that looks like all of your questions. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I wish we could all be out here together, but it is really cool to do these virtual trips. And you know, when you're doing a normal program, you can't just pull in and have Mr. Gene there or Dr. Betsy answer your question. So that really is a, a really nice treat. So thank you all for supporting Archbolds. Um, next week, I will be at Lake Annie for the virtual trip next Tuesday.